Relics to revolutions. That's been our theme for today. And we've talked about mostly the contemporary world. We've talked about the challenges that we face today. And that's not surprising. That's what TED Talks usually are about. We're about where we are today and the innovations, the ideas that are going to take us forward into this world. TED stands for, of course, technology, entertainment, and design. But the TED Talks have gone much farther than that. But relics are those things that we often feel that we've left behind. Relics are perhaps things best left for archives, for decoration. We've talked a lot about some of the basic needs that we've had and even the primeval needs, water. And I was pleased as a scholar of biblical and rabbinic literature to hear Genesis 1 cited. These are some of our most fundamental needs, including such abstract needs as love and comfort and compassion, food, structure, environment around us. But there are primeval fears that we have too. Death, of course, being the greatest. And darkness, because darkness, well, it represents the unknown. It represents that last passage that we make in death. And that's why, while water did pre-exist, and the, the lands were separated, the waters from the waters, the very first thing that God created, according to Genesis, was light. Vayoma Elohim Yahi Or. Vayahi Or. Light. Light drives away the darkness. It makes us feel safe. It makes us feel secure. While standing on the stage with glasses, it keeps me from seeing you and makes me feel a little bit more relaxed. <laughs> but that's why some of the earliest relics that we have are, in fact, lamps. Fire, light brought into the home to dispel the darkness. This lamp is one that my aunt and uncle gave me when I successfully defended my doctorate. It's a first century CE lamp. And you can see it's actually a fairly simple, primitive artifact. This relic has a little bit of touches of nobules on the top. You can see the hole for putting the wick into and another hole for putting the oil into. It's pretty simple. It's pretty primitive. And this is what our earliest lamps really look like, though this one, in terms of human lifespan or culture, is fairly recent. And the reality is that over the last millennia, lamps have changed very little. We had different substances, different fuel sources, wax, oil, animal oil, petroleum products. We have different structures for holding them. The menorah we just saw, the Diwali lamps here, the brass shells, and yet still largely the same. 18th century, we begin to see glass being used in fabrication. We begin to see kerosene and oils with lamps around them, an adjustable wick. But really, this isn't much different from that little first century oil lamp that we saw at the beginning. Not much had changed, of course, until we had gas that we could control. And we began to be able to bring fire, not just into our home, but specifically in certain places. We could put these gas lamp sconces in the wall. We could pipe the gas in. And now it was just a question of turning that cock, lighting the match, and you had light in your home. You didn't have to carry that kerosene lamp from place to place or your candles. And that's a good thing. Because when you think about it, when you bring fire into a home, bad things are going to happen. And in fact, Dr. Michio Kaku was here a couple of weeks ago to speak to, a, well, a packed auditorium. And he talked about the naysayers when electricity and electric lights were first brought into homes and building places by folks like Thomas Alva Edison here. He said the naysayers said that when you put electricity into homes, when you put electric lights in, there are going to be fires and electrocution, and people are going to die. And they were right. People do die. To this day, there are electrocutions and fires. Although, thankfully, Mythbusters has shown us that your Christmas tree lights 
you really got to work hard to set that tree on fire. <laughs> and so Edison, building on the work of others, gave us our first electric lights. And here we are today with all of this electricity, all of these lights, and all of this energy being consumed. You see, I don't really want to talk with you so much about lamps and light bulbs. What I really want to talk with you about is thinking ahead, about being folks who can predict problems, to be predictive problem solvers. Because I suppose we can not fault Edison and others for realizing where our power would come from. That we would be using massive quantities of coal, that we would create nuclear power. And of course, those folks didn't really seem to realize, well, there's stuff that comes out of that process and you gotta do something with it because it's kinda nasty and it lasts a really long time. And we've got oil plants and we have natural gas plants. But all of these and the majority of our energy needs are indeed being fueled by non-renewable sources. But my talk isn't about this either. My talk isn't about petroleum products. It's not about any of that. My talk is about how inventors, innovators, entrepreneurs, all of you here, you're creative people, you're wonderful people, and we don't have excuses anymore for also not being thoughtful people. We need to think ahead. We need to come up with not just the next great widget. We can't be so focused on the neat, cool project that we've, got, we've designed. Our iPhone app, that's going to make us $50. Really, I mean, actually, I should have asked Eric. You've made iPhone apps. Have they panned out well? Okay, I mean, I hope so, hope so. But when we create a new plane, when we create a new rocket fuel, when we create a new way of transmitting this image to the other side of the world instantaneously, we need to think about what is that impact. We need to be aware that there are always consequences, and there will always be unintended consequences. I don't think anyone expects anyone else to always understand the ramifications of what they're doing. But I think we can expect one another to be mindful of them, to take the time to move beyond just the neat little project we have in mind in front of us, and think about the economic consequences, the social consequences, the ramifications for the world around us. And the reason why there are no excuses for us is because we have those relics. We have history that we can observe. Who knows what lies out before us? Who knows what, what new technologies that we're going to create and develop while answering one problem over here, and yes, probably creating another problem over there. But if we learn from our history, if we think about it, we stand a chance of getting more of it right more often the first time. Finally, I want to share with you this quote by James Thurber. There are two kinds of light, the glow that illumines and the glare that obscures. Which kind of light do we want to be? Thank you all for being here today at TEDxPSU 2011, Relics to Revolution. Thank you. <laughs>